Hello, good morning. Today, our guest is the awesome Johan Norberg. And Johan, as you can see, is quite erudite. And today, Johan will be charting the rise of progress in human societies. Johan, what is the name of your latest book? My latest book is uh, Open, the story of human progress. Human progress. What is progress, Johan? Progress is the ability to do something today that you couldn't do yesterday. Uh, being Having access to more opportunities, to uh, new discoveries, could be technological innovations, could be economic uh, resources. Something that gives you the ability to uh, be a little bit more in charge of your life today than you were yesterday. Explicate the cases of human progress and their relationship to openness, starting with the Greeks. Yeah, I mean, we've had a couple of golden eras throughout history, uh, places where they suddenly had this rapid movement towards more scientific inquiry and more and often technological and economic progress as well. And if you're looking for a pl good place to start, it's ancient Greece and it's specifically Athens, I would say, because that was roughly 2,500 years ago. And that was because they were at the crossroads between civilizations. It was a trading society. Uh, they ventured out to other places, other cultures, learned from uh, their mistakes and from their insights. So trade and exchange made it possible for them to move towards um, better ways of both um, exploring the world and to create uh, at least a modest form of economic prosperity. And that's why openness is important because openness gives you access to more things than you have yourself. You might be the smartest people in the room, but your room is always very small. So if you want to discover something new, you need to stay in touch with everybody else and to see what are they discovering? What kind of new business models and technological innovations are they making use of? And then making use of that yourself. That's a safe bet if you want progress. You could have also titled your book, benchmarking the best strategy for economic growth because openness is really benchmarking it is definitely that's uh, the whole point of being curious about the world is to see what is going on elsewhere and how can we benefit from the lessons that they've learned in other places so uh, yes curiosity exchange benchmarking that's a key to progress and being receptive to a superior culture is also a consequence of openness. All perspectives are not equal. If all perspectives were equal, then all countries would be equally affluent. Some people like to argue that the Greeks stole from the Egyptian. This is not true. We're not going to discuss the issue. But based on my reading of history, the Greeks were receptive to foreign cultures. And if you are receptive to foreign cultures, this is a characteristic of a superior mind. So we should actually praise in the Greeks for being influenced by the Egyptians because they were. Yes, and that's what you see when you look at uh, civilizations that have prospered historically in one way or another, is that they are constantly making use of ideas and skills that they are picking up from other places. And that's really why trading civilizations have prospered so much more than, than others. And this is a reason why the ancient Greece, Greeks were uh, successful. They picked up, uh, they stood in constant contact with the Egyptians, uh, but uh, also sort of the, um, the whole Mesopotamian ancient uh, civilizations and all the way through, through Asia and, and the Mediterranean, picking up the best ideas as they went along. And if you think that's stealing, uh, well, in that case, culture is stealing because culture is always finding something new elsewhere and combining it with what you have. And then there's this spark in, in the coalition between old and new ideas that really sets uh, progress in motion. That's why cultural appropriation is such a dubious concept. 
even as a writer, when you read people who are more expertise, they when you read people with more expertise, they can ignite a spark to improve your writing. Exactly. The whole idea of the cultural appropriation is something wrong. It's an incredibly ahistorical uh, perspective on the world because cultural appropriation is culture. <laughs> Every cult, there's no pure culture that's sort of uh, removed from the influences of other cultures and civilizations. Every culture, if you go back in time, has been influenced and created through these exchanges, collisions, and combinations from, from various places. And that's a good thing. Pure cultures aren't cultures. They, they die. They are museum pieces. If you want a thriving culture the, with a future, it always needs this influx of fresh air, of new perspectives, and even perspectives that you don't like uh, yourself uh, from other places, because they always bring that element of innovation and forces you to to uh, think a little bit more and, and longer and harder. I mean, that's why I have, I have these books. I appropriate ideas from all the other great authors that came before me. That's the reason why I can come up with the ideas that I have. Nothing exists in a vacuum. Walter Isaacson, he has a book on innovation and his story is quite similar. It is a collaborative process. And as one writer notes, you're only dishonest when you are appropriating ideas from your profession. So if a scientist is inspired by philosophical ideas and he blends these ideas together to create a new perspective, he's an innovator <laughs> because that shows depth of reading and thinking. Yeah, so, and, and I've done something quite similar. I have a short piece, a blog on political correctness and I, appropriate some simple ideas from evolution. I view political correctness as another form of e evolution in human society, but, but an, a negative one. It's like a, my version of mimetic theory. People, for whatever reason, either to acquire power or to signal more moral validation, they form these groups. So polit political correctness is just an expression of all humans up to or organize themselves. And I'm yet, I'm yet to see an evolutionary perspective on, perspective on it. One writer, he wrote a piece for Ario magazine, David Sloan Wilson. He gets it a bit, I, I agree with his opinion, but other than David, I'm, I'm, I don't know of many people who are analyzing PC culture from the vantage point of evolution. That's interesting. But I mean, you see that historically, I think, in many cultures that they reach evolutionary dead ends because they become fixated on what they've already come up with in one way or another and think that they have the truth in one way or another. And they have to protect that truth from outside influences and from dissenters within society. And to me, this I mean, that's what many nationalist uh, temptations in history have been about or tribalist influences you have reached a certain point or stage in your thinking and you now have to protect it against the outside world and to me political correctness and uh, cancel culture is a version of that even though they would think of themselves as as the opposite of nationalists but it's the same kind of purity test you think that you've already reached the truth but truth is fragile and uh, dissenters are out there to destroy it. So you have to protect it and you have to uh, cancel and destroy those who, who are opposed to you. So it's just, it's two sides of the same coin. I, I think this, of the same tribalist coin, uh, political correctness and uh, ethno-nationalism. And political correctness is also re regressive. There is one, prominent German academic and he writes articles on the evolutionary stages of, stages of human beings, George Uster Dikoff. And he would, I, well, he, he has not written this as yet, but based on what I have read, it is plausible to argue that political correctness suggests that humanity is actually receding because pre-modern people were tribal. They were tribal and they assigned culpability to, to their enemies 
because of what their ancestors had done in the past. And that's a tribal mindset. It's a tribal mindset and a backward mindset. So a white man in the 21st century cannot be responsible for slavery because his ancestors enslaved blacks or Indians. That's a, that's a backward mindset. It's a pre-modern worldview. Yeah. But the problem with history is that it's not all linear. I think we have a, an open and a closed mindset within each and every one of us. We are double-natured. We are open to new possibilities, to exchange, to learning from others and, and specializing and exchanging and growing intellectually and economically. We do that when we think there's room for a positive sum game. But we also have this tribal list uh, closed mindset within us because for hundreds of thousands of years, the most dangerous enemy to, uh, to us were other groups that cooperated even better. So we had to be a little bit suspicious uh, if they turned out that they were disloyal to us, if they were about to raid and, us and steal our stuff and kill us. So you had to be on the lookout and worried about what the other tribes were up to. And I think both of those things are here with us today as well. And um, you see the openness anytime when we have open markets and open societies and scientific collaboration and uh, building businesses and opportunities. But the closed mindset is there as well, especially when we think that we're in a time of crisis and we are being threatened or our way of life is being threatened. Then it's very easy to be tempted to go back into the group where we have all the safe answers and solutions to problems and then destroy everything else. We've seen this, it's a cyclical phenomena throughout history that uh, cultures are unfortunately often tempted by this tribalist mindset. And yeah, we might be in such a cycle now as well. And uh, unfortunately it is promoted as truth by the media. So Black Panther has potential to be a better movie, but the history is inaccurate. Axum and Mali, were trading empires. Historically, black trading empires did quite well. A closed black empire would have failed. It would not have been an empire. Yeah, that's a that's a good point. Yes, yeah, uh, so I, I have an article on the no, topic for my yeah. and I I just cannot understand why people like Black Panther because it does not represent African culture. Even the Asante. And, uh, they, they have a saying, a, a, a community that is small or does not respect strangers doesn't grow, something to this effect. It's written in their language. So even people in Africa recognize that if you restrict trade with the outside world, you're not going to prosper. And Black Panther is this glorious film celebrating an isolated empire, which is really a bad counterfactual. <laughs> Yeah, uh, though I have to confess that I really love the Black Panther movie. I, I thought it you was like great, it. <laughs> but I, I, I certainly did. But that point was so incredibly ahistorical and, 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 and terrible uh, because, uh, as you point out, uh, we've had many successful African uh, cultures historically. They were the open ones, the ones who traded and ventured abroad and constantly learned from others. That's how you create thriving societies, not by isolating yourselves from everybody else. You can do that, but then the result is North Korea, not Black Panther. Yes, there is even an old article published in a French language journal looking at the Dayomi Empire and the right of literacy in Dayomi appropriated a policy from Y country, B policy, from C country. And I'm like, the evidence is clear. Real black emperors did not operate like the Black Panther. Yeah. Yeah, so I, no, I can't I forgive mean, that they, movie. They, I like the aesthetics, but no, historically it's just madness. Yeah, and I mean, they, they, in a way, one reason why Sub-Saharan Africa is so much poorer than other continents is that they chose the Wakanda way uh, partly because um, European colonizers created artificial borders and destroyed old trade routes, partly because the then liberators, uh, they became the new colonizers. They became domestic occupiers in their own society and destroyed the opportunities to do business and to trade. George Ayite, the uh, economist from Ghana, has written several books that I've learned a lot from of how we had historically 
um, impressive trade networks throughout the African continent. Uh, a long time before the, we had the authoritarian nation states and before European colonizers got there. And those who made mo most use of, of that and uh, protected it the most with property rights and uh, a, a rudimentary degree of rule of law, they prospered because they chose the, the non-Wakanda way. Yeah, European co colonialists in Africa had a socialist mindset. I keep reminding people, colonialism is a form of sociali socialism. So obviously it will be extractive and the European preferred white settlers to black Africans and blacks were even prevented from exporting certain crops. Now I've d discussed colonialism and written on it on several occasion because I think we should paint a balanced picture, but on this point, we're both correct. You, you, colonialism is a form of socialism. So when people say that the legacy of colonialism is negative, I'm like, yes, there, there, there are some positive benefits like improved education, better healthcare, but for the most part, colonizers had an extractive mindset. So you, you can't expect growth with colonialism. It, it's impossible. At least from Peter and growth, you can get Smith and growth because America grew as a colony, Cuba grew as a colony, but serious dis disruptions are unlikely under colonialism. The, the innovations are usually, in well, if it's incremental, it's not an innovation. Yes, as I said, as, as I told some, somebody recently, an innovation is only useful when it disrupts society. So if your idea is brilliant, but it's not disrupting society, it's not an innovation. But back to Greece. I like to talk about Africa. I think some years ago, I just became really interested in African history because we know so little. Jeffrey Williamson told me that if he were a younger person, he would definitely be studying Africa. That's the next frontier in economic research. So back to, to, the, to the Greeks. Why did growth fizzle? Well... This is interesting. This is not just a Greek phenomena. Um, one interesting thing when you look at the golden ages of history is that they're fairly short. I mean, you might come up with a Roman Empire a couple of hundred years that they were uh, having some sort of, of growth at least. But in most places, it's just a couple of generations, but a couple of brilliant generations when they had this extraordinary outburst of creativity and innovation. And then it fizzles and it disappears. And um, it's the same place, it's the same people, it's the same language, it's the same history, but suddenly that spark, that energy is gone. And that teaches us something important about how difficult it is to create those eras. It's dependent on the kind of openness that you're able to uphold in those societies, make it possible to, uh, make sure that it's not just openness towards the rest of the world, but also an openness towards within society. So that surprising innovation and new business models can appear anywhere within that group. And that's problematic because that always threatens the incumbents. It always threatens the old elites, religious, political, economic elites who built their power base on the status quo, on a certain uh, system. And when that system is changed, they feel frightened. So there is um, something called Cardwell's Law. Uh, I've learned this from Joel Mokir. The economic Stop, historian. hold on. I'm a big fan of Joel Mokir. He's fantastic. Yes. Um, and uh, you can't go wrong if you pick up one of his books. And if you and, and he's uh, coined the phrase Codwell's Law after a technology historian, that after a while, those elites are going to destroy that openness. If it becomes too innovative, too creative, they want to block it and destroy it. The dissenters, the innovators, the entrepreneurs. And this happened eventually in uh, Athens uh, as well after a couple of uh, unfortunate uh, wars and uh, after a couple of uh, after a plague we had this reaction from old elites so more oligarchic elites took control of society and made it a little bit less creative and innovative and uh, all it takes is just a little bit of a fa of a failure in that regard and and then you won't see the new surprises so that it keeps on going openness requires bourgeois dignity so the Yoruba and the Asante people, 
they traded, but their cultures were differential. So aristocrats had to be respected. In the Uber society, you had to greet successful people who were from a better background. And I think that one of the downfalls is that Africa, unlike Europe, did not have a bourgeois revolution. And again, I've, I'm yet to see a paper on this topic, but bourgeois dignity, yes, there are crit criticisms of the argument, but it's quite important. You have to respect commerce and successful people. It is, and uh, that's one important takeaway, I think, from Deirdre McCloskey's work, that something important happened in specifically the Dutch Republic and then in England and Scotland in the um, 16th and the 17th um, uh, and 18th century, was well, specifically the, the uh, 1600s and the 1700s. And that wasn't available in Europe until then. Uh, I mean, Athens and the Roman Empire, they were powerful, successful. They also were dependent on trade to a large extent, but they didn't like traders. They didn't respect merchants. They thought this was some sort of dirty work that could be handled by slaves and by uh, foreigners. Um, no, the, the important people in society were thinkers in uh, Athens or warriors or, uh, well, the nobility and, and soldiers. And, uh, and it's a kind of a, an aristocratic mindset which makes it very difficult to for people to go into all kinds of professions and to be respected if they succeed and be able to become fabulously wealthy if they come up with new business practices and uh, trade ventures. And uh, if you don't have that, it's important to um, to make the world safe for markets and for progress. And that only really happens in, I would point to the Dutch Republic, the, the Netherlands in the 1600s as the pivotal moment when it happened. And it happened partly because this incredibly small society of 1 million people, 1.5 million because they had open borders to migrants, uh, so after a while they, they were 1.5 million people, they were part of the Spanish empire um, but they rebelled against it and they these merchants who didn't even have a uh, one unifying religion they didn't even have a standing army they didn't have uh, a strong nobility they didn't even have land they had to build it from scratch from from the ocean uh, basically they managed those 1.5 million people managed to defeat the spanish empire and uh, become independent. And at that time, the world had to look to them, to the Dutch and see, what did you do <laughs> that made you so successful? Turn this little tiny poor part of, of the Spanish empire into the world's richest country. And the one thing that set them apart was that they were open-minded, they were tolerant to different points of view and had a thriving intellectual, cultural atmosphere. And they cherished the bourgeoisie, those merchants and traders and entrepreneurs who experimented with new business models, with new goods and production processes and become successful. They were considered heroes in that society. And therefore, they also got more of them and became so fabulously wealthy. Bourgeois dignity, what an exciting concept. So I'm going to give a contemporary example in Jamaica. A Jamaican company, it's a real estate investment company. I actually bought stocks in this company. It's called First Rock. The company was financing a project and the Jamaican prime minister said, do not be perturbed by bad mind people. So in Jamaica, bad mind, bad mind is the term for envy. And I'm saying this to argue that Jamaica does not have a bourgeois culture. One politician actually attacked the bourgeois, not necessarily capitalists, but the idea of a bourgeois culture. And I wrote a letter to the editor over two years ago saying, no, that's nonsense. Bourgeois values are actually good. It's just like in the United States, the Forbes 400. Americans love wealth. Um, it's a, it is an individualistic and, and achievement culture. But I doubt that a Forbes 400 feature would be successful in Jamaica. 
Because if the average person in Jamaica reads John Brown is worth ten billion dollars, he's going to say John Brown is so rich, yet people are suffering. <laughs> and you really, Jamaica has suffered from slow economic growth. The IMF program, surprisingly, has been quite successful. But I don't think that the politicians appreciate that we we can't actualize our true potential if we don't change our culture. We have to become open innovative and curious. So the prime minister wants the country to become a tech hub, but Jamaica is known for political tribalism and this is a negative and tribal con- cultures are not innovative. So you really can't become a tech hub if people are not curious and unwilling to deviate from the norm. It's virtually impossible. That's a very interesting example and I absolutely agree. The problem is that when you begin to see some examples of success in poor countries that's what people say why should that guy be allowed to be so fabulously rich when so many people are suffering and then you began to often attack the uh, those entrepreneurs and redistribute those resources which really only means that the resources are being consumed and not being invested uh, long term to make that society even richer and lift everybody in those places so what it does is that whenever you see someone succeed you stamp it out you destroy that wealth creation that moment when you begin to uh, to attack entrepreneurs and uh, and wealth creators and that's incredibly dangerous and that's what we've seen historically again and again and only in a few places have we said that look they have been successful they've given something important to society Let's encourage them and hope that more people will do the same. And those are the places that have become wealthy. Like the case study of Barbados versus Jamaica in the 70s. Jamaica had Barbados and, sorry, Jamaica had Manly. And unlike Barbados, it was more critical of entrepreneurs. The prime minister at the time actually encouraged elites to flee to, to Florida. But you can't run a country without the human capital of the elites. So what happened? The economy contracted by 25% because of the oil shock and these policies. Some people like to talk about the the intervention of the CIA, but that's not a relevant point. I'm a realist in international affairs. Jamaica is in America's backyard. If the prime minister is friends with a dictator, obviously the CIA will intervene. I'm just a realist. So I don't take that argument quite seriously. The legitimacy of the intervention, that's a different story, but it's just the reality of geopolitics. And leaders who overplay their hands often fail. So Lee Kuan Yew, Lee Kuan Yew spent time learning from rich countries. He did not engage in global politics to say that communism was superior to capitalism or the capitalists were exploiting the communists, Lee Kuan Yew was focused. He went to Japan, he went to to Europe, he went to America, and he met that brilliant Harvard professor. And as we say, the rest is history. Just like if when you're in a country, you can't be distracted. If you are distracted, people will pay dearly for your distractions. Like in Jamaica, where today we're still paying dearly. Yes, a country that's too rich to be too poor. I, 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 I like to talk about Jamaica on this show because I think it's such an interesting case study. Aaron Graham, if you're, if you're unfamiliar with this writer, you really need to read him. He has papers on innovation in Jamaica in the colonial era and on the incorporation of businesses. And Jamaica was one of the first countries to adopt industrial technology. So it has no reason to be this poor. But that's Very what ha- yes, but that's what what happens when you don't have a bourgeois culture. However, mercantilism. The consensus in economics is that mercantilism is expensive. However, it created a business structure that somewhat aided the industrial growth of Europe. And my argument is quite simple: mercantilism is protectionism, but it is based on trade. Mercantilist powers, they don't want to buy goods from other countries, but they want people to buy goods from them. So it's really not close. It's really not a, it's not a closed system. 
what's your take? Yeah, that's right. It's not entirely closed because you want the wealth and the, the gold from uh, other places when you export goods to them, but you don't want to buy anything from them. So it's sort of a half-hearted uh, version of, of trade. And, and the problem with it, apart from the fact that it's an unstable uh, relationship with the rest of the world, if everybody wants to export and nobody wants to import, then... Uh, well, good luck. <laughs> but, but the bigger problem, I'd say, is that it's a complete uh, misunderstanding of uh, what makes trade beneficial. As Adam Smith pointed out, the greatest benefit to you as a uh, trader or a business or a country does not really come from the goods that you export. It comes from the goods that you import from other places. Your exports that's the price you pay to be able to buy the things you need from other places. And we can all see that in our everyday lives. When we go to work in the morning, that's our way of exporting. That's our way to work hard to get some resources so that we can go to the store and import the books, the food, the clothes, the furniture that we want. And lots of people, I think, would agree that it would be even better if we were able to export a little bit less, work a little bit less, and get a little bit more from other places, import even more from uh, the others. So that's the biggest problem with the, uh, the mercantilist view of international world trade, that they forego the most important benefit of trade, being able to access the things, the goods, the ideas that you're not able to produce as effectively yourself and remember the voyages of the europeans had an explicit message to do de to develop new markets so they want to trade but it's a one-sided trade and that's the difference between the voyages of europe and china the chinese were, were interested in projecting superpower status and maybe getting new tributary states but to create new markets, that was not the intention. But the Tokugawa, Japan, the Tokugawa Shogunate, I have been doing some reading on Japan during that period, and I'm yet to see a serious art article making a forceful argument that the economy con contra contracted severely during that era. The American Institute of Economic Research actually published an article by a, scholar, by a scholar noting that during the Tokugawa shogunate, Japan didn't collapse. So is this undermining your argument of openness? Well, it didn't collapse. Uh, neither did the uh, Chinese uh, Ming Dynasty. Uh, uh, they had a similar policy of abandoning international trade, burning the boats and uh, going inwards, but they stopped prospering. They stopped uh, being successful in rapidly improving uh, living standards and, um, and wealth. And I mean, it can be stable, uh, isolationism and isolation from the rest of the world. I think that North Korea and Cuba has proved that, uh, yes, you can destroy the living standards and opportunities and hopes and dreams of your population, but you might still be able to remain in power for, for a very long time. Um, but it took for Japan to get out of uh, the Middle Ages, it took the opening up uh, to the world after the Meiji Restoration in the 1860s when they for 100 years uh, grew faster than any other country on the planet because they had an ambitious and uh, outspoken policy of picking up ideas and technologies from everywhere else. So within just a few decades, they've managed to not just come up with the kinds, same kinds of um, electricity production, uh, textile manufacturing and uh, international trade as as European powers, but even sort of the same kind of clothes and walking around with hats and umbrellas in the same way as you did in, in London at that time. So I think that Japan uh, during the Shogunate and, and afterwards after the Me Meiji Restoration is an interesting case point in how 
you can only create those rapid periods of uh, really economic technological flourishing by being open. Ah, but this is what people usually don't say about Japan during that era. It was not truly closed. The Japanese kept tabs on the Dutch. That's right. That's <laughs> yes, a good they, point. they kept yeah. tabs on the Dutch and the Chinese. As Eric Rigmar says, in a modern society, change is institutionalized. Modern societies know how to adapt to change. So the Japanese, in the era of the Meiji restorations, had an advantage over China because even though they were somewhat isolated, the Japanese were serious about benchmarking. So it was easier for that society to, to adjust. Yeah. People often underlook that over people often do underlook that point. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. And that often goes for very isolated societies as well. Even if you're North Korea, you constantly try to peek at the technological progress going on in other places and, and steal their best ideas, because otherwise you would suffer tremendously. Well, suffer even more. Song China, another brilliant case study. Why was China so successful during those years? Because first it was at peace uh, uh, after long periods of war. And second, it created a sort of domestic peace under the Song emperors because they were interested in reviving open and cosmopolitan traditions in China that had been lost for, for a long time. And they did that through a system of relative rule of law, uh, relative strength of property rights in within uh, China so that the farmers became really sort of small scale petty capitalists uh, and could begin to experiment with new production methods and with, with trade all over, um, all over China. So it became a, um, a cosmopolitan trading society where the entrepreneurial energies of the Chinese people was uh, set free. And that created some remarkable uh, results. Uh, Song China grew rapidly economically, but also culturally. Um, one of the roles of, of the government was just making the best knowledge accessible. Speaking of benchmarking, they produced the uh, texts on the best um, uh, ways of um, uh, production of textiles, uh, of uh, uh, crop rotation, of uh, uh, trade, the best ships, and transferred those ideas throughout the whole of society. And they they became the most uh, successful civilization on, on the planet. Uh, I mean, 1000 years ago, they uh, navigated with a nautical compass. They uh, made, waged war when they waged war with gunpowder and uh, they printed books with a printing press. The three innovations that Karl Marx writing in the 1860s said were typical for the European bourgeoisie of the 19th century. Uh, the Chinese did that 1,000 years ago. But China also followed the wrong route. The Chinese were leaders in building ships, and that program was jettisoned. Why? Because they turned inwards. And there we're back to the, the cycles in history. After this long period of openness that made China the most powerful um, part of the world, well, two things happened. One is this dangerous temptation of saying, now we've got everything. We don't need anything from other civilizations. We should protect ourselves against them. So why venture out with our armadas and learn from others when they're so primitive compared to us? Uh, that's some sort of conceit that often takes place in successful um, cultures. But the other thing was that they began to, to suffer from threats from other places. And uh, you had uh, invasions from nomads and later on from the Mongols. And uh, they were successful in invading um, Song China after a while. 
And, uh, and that didn't matter much because Kublai Khan's China was also sort of trying to revive song traditions of, of openness, but that experience of having been invaded after having lost created this terrible sense that we went wrong somewhere and add to that the Black Death, the, the, the great pandemic of that era, created this sense that, look, somehow we've lost our important traditions. Perhaps we should protect ourselves from all these influences from, from other places. So what happened after the Ming uh, takeover of, of China in the 14th century was that they said, we don't need anything from other places. It only brings us war and pandemics. So let's close down our borders. Let's uh, ban international trade on pain of death. Let's uh, destroy the big boats uh, that could have explored and discover the world. Um, they just rotted away and some were apparently burnt and um, burned the old encyclopedias and because uh, they only contain dangerous uh, new ideas. They did this because they thought it would make China great again. Um, turning back to some sort of imaginary nostalgic version of your past. But in reality, it gave China 500 years of stagnation, which turned the richest country on the planet into one of the poorest countries on the planet. And some people are still not learning from the Chinese. It's unfortunate. Their leaders today were still skeptical of open trade, even though trade openness correlates positively with growth in Africa. But what do I know? I'm just a random person. The bureaucracy in China, were bureaucrats preferred to traders? Yes, quite often being a, uh, you know, there's a reason why we call bureaucrats mandarins, because we, we learned that bureaucracy from the Chinese. They had a fairly uh, established and well thought out and sometimes quite meritocratic system of uh, bureaucracy uh, in China, which was uh, important and uh, influential, it could destroy progress at times when they were too strong, but it could also open uh, up to new opportunities whenever they, they agreed, accepted um, and trade and growth in, in that society. One problem though was exactly this, it didn't really create that bourgeois um, culture, it could have done that at the end of the Song Dynasty. In the 13th century, you read about a some sort of an early renaissance and or enlightenment where there is this process of self-discovery and self-improvement and you see entrepreneurs becoming successful, but they never really got out of the, the ancient idea of the most important thing is really to be a servant of the emperor and of uh, venturing into, into uh, the bureaucracy. And um, when the Ming, when the Ming dynasty took over, they, this went into overdrive. They really thought that these entrepreneurial traditions and the economic openness must have been the result of us losing to the Mongols, while in effect it was the reason why China could uh, withstand them for much longer than, than anybody else. Uh, but that meant that they became so incredibly focused on stability. Their ideology was status quo, try to protect everything. And then obviously a, an entrepreneur, an innovator, uh, the bourgeoisie, they're disturbers of the peace, while instead you need to build a wall of bureaucracy, <laughs> which really protects the status quo rather than opening up to any surprises anywhere. Great story. But now you have another exercise. You're going to tell us about Genghis Khan. I've been hearing that Genghis Khan promoted trade. Yes, he's a great paradox in, in history. You know, he was not a, a great liberal or a humanitarian. He was probably the most vicious and brutal warlord of, of all times. But the interesting thing is that within the empire, when he built the largest land empire in history in just one generation, quite extraordinary, um, he, within that empire, he established open trade and also religious freedom and a system of meritocracy because he knew that coming from um, Mongol 
uh, nomads. We don't have much of a culture to force onto everybody else. Instead, let's learn from everybody else. So let's go to China and to Persia and to Europe and pick up the best ideas that they have. And that's why they were so successful. They always picked up new ideas, new technologies, new ways of waging war. And that's why they could defeat those who had protected just their own traditions for a long time. And then you needed religious freedom, for example, because even if you were a Muslim or a Christian, but you were better at um, building uh, uh, machines with which to um, uh, destroy um, uh, walls surrounding cities, you should be promoted and become your lead engineer. Uh, so he he wasn't uh, as he was strategically tolerant because that was the way to succeed in in society, and that's the reason why the Mongols were so incredibly successful. Genghis Khan, quite a paradox indeed. So you are from Sweden, and we hear it all the time, even though the argument is constantly being debunked. Sweden is socialist. Sweden is a rich socialist country. But you have something different to say. Sweden can finance welfare because of the free market. Tell us about the Swedish Adam Smith. Yeah, yeah, we had a Swedish Adam Smith in the um, 1750s and 60s, um, a priest, uh, Anders Chudenius, from the poorest rural parts of what was then Eastern uh, Sweden, now Finland. He began to develop some of the ideas of uh, open markets and of uh, the spontaneous organization of the economy as long as the price mechanism is um, is free, and uh, he, he basically wrote about the invisible hand eleven years before Adam Smith did it. Uh, and so Anders Chudenius, that's a name to remember. And he was also politically liberal in other ways. He um, was a member of the Swedish Parliament, and there he implemented, managed to convince others to implement a freedom of speech statute in uh, seventeen sixty six, which was basically, well, decades before other countries did the same thing. So he was quite important and he managed to influence Swedish society and some of his successors uh, managed to change Sweden dramatically in the mid 1800s. And uh, they turned Sweden into a country with a very limited government and a very open market with the freedom to do business and freedom to trade with the rest of the world. And this set Sweden on a great path. And for 100 years, we had very rapid growth in Sweden under a system of open markets and lower taxes than other European countries, even lower than the United States until the 1960s, basically. And that's what made Sweden so wealthy. That's what made Sweden so successful. And at that time, when we were already one of the richest countries uh, on the planet, then Swedish politicians said, hmm, perhaps we could redistribute some of these results and build a bigger welfare state. But that came later on, after wealth had already been created. For further information, our listeners may read Scandinavian Unexceptionalism and the Secret Ingredients of Swedish Success. Excellent books. Yes, and, uh, and if you want to see something on, online, you can watch Sweden Lessons for America, question mark, a, a documentary film made by me for American Public Television, which traces Sweden's story from Anders Chudenius to the success story to 20 years of experiments with socialism in the 1970s and 80s and how that ended in a terrible failure. And we then got a new political consensus from the left to the right to begin to liberalize the Swedish economy again. And once again, we are doing fairly well. Yes, or people can also read your report for Cato. You did a Cato report when two or three years ago and you have an article on libertarianism.org and other blogs on keto so those are so those are good sources now we're going to talk about something more contemporary covid19 as openness aided in europe's responsiveness to covid19 that's your paper 
What are the findings? Well, you know, whenever we have a pandemic, people become frightened and they think that, oh, we should have had domestic production of all these things. We can't rely on trade when everybody wants particular goods. Well, what I've learned when I looked into this is quite the opposite. It didn't help a country much to have large scale domestic production of, for example, protective garments. Uh, China had a lot of it. But even China had to import two billion face masks and hundreds of millions of pieces of garment in just the first months to deal with um, their crisis. So what you need is global supply chains. You need to have diversified trade so that you're able to buy from others. In Europe, what we saw with uh, protective garments is that in the first month of the pandemic, there was a decline in trade with other European countries because everybody suffered at the same time. So for example, the French and the Germans, they even banned exports of protective garments during this period. What saved us was imports from the rest of the world because in just one month, uh, after having been very stable for years, the imports of, of protective garments, it increased incredibly by 44%. And this helped hospitals and their staff to get, uh, to get access to uh, these, this protection. And we see the same thing with face masks, with gas masks, with many medical supplies during this period. What saved us was international trade. And this tells you something important, I think, about um, the importance of global markets. We tend to think, and politicians often say, that we should produce everything that we need all by ourselves right here. In Europe, for example, let's produce everything in Europe so that we have it the next time crisis strikes. Well, the problem is that most crises, whether it be war or a an epidemic or natural disaster, it strikes a particular region at a particular time. And then everybody wants the same things and production of it might have been destroyed. And in that case, you are all out of supplies. Everything collapses at the same time. And even if we had had big production in, in Europe, the French and the Germans would have stopped us from getting it because they suffered from COVID at exactly the same time. What saved us was the fact that China and South Korea and Taiwan, they had, um, Japan had already gone through the worst stages of the pandemic. So their factories had opened up again so that we could buy from them, just as they had bought from us a couple of months earlier. So concentration of supply chains is dangerous. It's not resilient. Uh, openness to trade with various trading partners. That's the way to build resilience. That's what I learned from the pandemic. And I read that paper and I, did I cite it in, a, in, in one of my articles? Maybe I did, I think so. So Johan, always a pleasure to listen to your erudition and to read your articles, but unfortunately I have to go away. As I say, brevity is a spice of life and people like shorter videos. So bye Johan. Thank you very much. This was a pleasure. Yes. Take care.